Our world is brimming with stories. Every moment, every instant, somewhere, a story is born, a legend woven into existence through the experiences and hardships of man and monster alike. Maybe it is a tale of heroism, or one of devastation and misery. Perhaps it inspires joy, or evokes sorrow. Whatever their flavor may be, stories are the bedrock of culture, history, and humanity itself. Thus, among its many duties, the Hunter's Guild also records and collects stories and legends that would otherwise be lost to time. Be it oral reproductions, ancient scrolls, or even the diaries of their own hunters, the guild archives are a treasure trove of tales worth telling. Which is why today, one such story will be presented. This story is one that is told freely within the cities of the guild, and with much glee. It is a story about assumptions, and about finding value even in the most deceptively innocuous places. A tale of arrogance and redemption. But most of all, it is the story of a small island community standing tall in the face of devastation and existential danger. The ship swayed back and forth in the ocean breeze. As I sat there, slumped against the railing of the deck, I noticed the scent of the air becoming noticeably more coastal. We were almost there. I scoffed and rested my head, thinking of what had led me to this distant, forsaken place. I looked down onto my two swords, my dual blades, lying on the floor partially wrapped in a cloth. In their sheen, I was reminded of my failure and of my demotion. Good for nothing, imbecile, dead weight. The words still rang in my ears, as did the verdict that the guild had enacted upon me, a gracious decree that merely gave me a new mission in order to redeem myself. But it was nothing but a platitude. I was being sent into the middle of nowhere to solve a problem no one in the guild administration truly cared about. This wasn't an opportunity. It was simply an excuse to remove me from the important work of the guild and exile me somewhere where I can't harm anyone with my incompetence anymore. A sudden force began shaking the ship, throwing me out of my brooding and into the floor. How appropriate. These must be the tremors I'm supposed to investigate, I thought to myself. The village I was being carted off to had been experiencing violent earthquakes for some time now, and somehow the chief of this backwater town had managed to push the guild administration to consider it a monster-related problem. Perhaps the guild had decided to kill two Gargoa in one strike, shut up the militant chieftain by sending me here, a hopeless screw-up they want to get rid of anyway. I couldn't help but grin bitterly. This was my life now. Better get used to it. As we closed in on the small fishing village, I could see even across the water that what had been a brief light tremor for us at sea had really wrecked the village. Some houses had collapsed, the wooden platform that suspended part of the village above the water was tilted, and a few kids had gotten hurt, probably by falling. Truly not the best time to be arriving, but nothing about the situation has been ideal so far, so why start now? As the ship docked and the first mate called my name, I packed my belongings, inhaled deeply, and took my first step 
into Moga Village. It had been a few days since my arrival when I first got the chance to sit down in my cabin and truly reflect on what exactly I had gotten myself into. My welcome into Moga had been a lot warmer than what I had expected. Despite the fact that the village had just before been hit by an earthquake, every villager was extremely kind and friendly upon meeting me. The fishermen admired my physique, the children asked to touch my swords, and the tradeswoman emphasized how good it was to, uh, have a strapping young man in the village again. The foul mood I had been cultivating on the ship felt almost embarrassing when confronted with such warmth. The villagers quickly funneled me over to their chief. He was a skinny, tan man, white of hair and jolly of temper. His face and smile were inviting, despite the large scar that ran across one of his eyes. Like all villagers, he was mostly nude, covered in a loincloth and coat. Even at his old age, his body was lean and strong. This man had obviously been quite physically imposing in his youth. The chief welcomed me warmly and gave me a quick tour of Moga village. I was shown to the smithy, the farm, the store, and finally, my room. It was honestly quite overwhelming, but the friendly villagers helped me through it. Only two places were currently closed. The fishery, which had taken the worst damage from the recent earthquake, and the quest desk. The local quest maiden, a jumpy girl named Aisha, assured me it would be up and running again as soon as, I quote, she could be bothered to fix it up again. One of Moga's most interesting features that I was introduced to was the fact that there lies a hunting ground right outside of it, the Moga Woods, officially called the Deserted Island Zone in the Guild Libraries. Much of my work would likely happen out there, which is why it was quite disheartening to hear that the base camp of the area, the fortification from which all hunting activity must be initiated, had been damaged in the earthquake. I was quickly carted off to the hunting ground alongside the chief's son, a hulking man whose muscles were only rivaled by his appetite. He showed me around the area as we gathered the materials necessary to repair the base camp. I must say I was truly stumped by this endeavor. I came here expecting a barren heap of nothing, a bump on the rear end of the world, and yet this island was beautiful. Serene streams flow through lush green woodlets, the beaches inspire a sense of sublime, and even the caves hold a sort of mysterious attraction. I could not help but feel truly enraptured by what I was seeing here, a small island that was yet full of diversity. Thinking back, even the village was like that, textured and diverse, inhabited by humans, Vivarians, and even some elusive sea people, their characteristic body markings a sign of their nigh-on legendary lineage. Before long, the base camp had been repaired and my work was ready to begin. The chief's son gave me a bone-breakingly strong pat on the back and we returned to Moga village, where I entered my cabin and began this rethread of my experiences. Perhaps, I thought to myself this punishment would not be nearly as bad as I had expected. I was still shaking. For the past few days, I had been helping out Moga Village by doing various quests assigned to the region, bring in materials and zeni for the repairs of the various village structures, I ended up spending a lot of time around these islands. For example, I fought off a bizarre yellow monster called a Ludroth that was blocking the trading routes for Moga's fishing fleet. Its spongy mane made for an excellent trading good as well, and the money we earned from that could help us repair the fishing fleet, which was soon in working order again. On some occasions, I was carted off to some other regions to complete some more elaborate tasks, such as capture particularly problematic Beroth. 
the reward of which was a crate of new spears for the fishermen of Moga, as well as instructions for creating them for the smithy. I explored every nook and cranny of Moga Island, and to be quite honest, my time here had thus far been very pleasant. The first shock would come when I was asked to gather fish and mollusks from the sunken coasts off the island. Moga practices a unique hunting style that necessitates the hunter be able to swim and dive freely, and as their local guild representative, it was my duty to learn this skill so that I could adequately help out in the region. This task was meant as another low-stakes opportunity for some training, swimming about in the local waters and gathering some small critters. I happily obliged, especially since I had made no progress towards identifying the cause of the tremors. The villagers seemed to know something, but none had so far shared anything with me besides that they were certain it was caused by a monster due to its pattern. So any surveys into the island was a welcome way to investigate the waters and hopefully find something that would push the chief to reveal some of his suspicions to me. As I plunged into the water and began diving towards the reefs where I'd find my targets, chewing the oxygenating airweed to hold my breath much longer than usual, I could sense that something was off. The same way the air feels different before a storm, so too did the water feel uneasy, crackling with a sort of tension. Disregarding this sensation, I continued onwards, only to notice it getting stronger and stronger. By the time I had reached one of the central reefs of the Moga coast, I was certain. This was not just some abstract intuition. The water was ever so slightly electrified, a weak but disconcerting current running through this entire area. This could only be the work of some kind of thunder element creature, but what could possibly have enough power to change the feel of an entire coastal sea? I received my answer soon enough. I hadn't even completed four more strokes before something odd entered my vision. A sort of curled up serpent, its deep blue scales making it nearly invisible at a distance. Its head was crowned with dull brown horns, and its short legs were armed with orange claws. I had never seen such a creature. Before I could even begin to contemplate my next move, the creature stirred and began to unfold. On its back, I could now see multiple large spikes, dull and brown like the creature's horns. It seemed to hover around in the water calmly, only moving very slowly. And then it turned its head. And then it looked directly at me. Whether what I felt next was fear coursing through my body or a current in the water changing, I don't dare to investigate. Either way, through some primal instinct, I immediately knew that it was not just looking at me. It had seen me. Its slow movements began heading more and more into my direction until it was approaching me head on. With every second it got closer, the tension in the water got more oppressive. The beast was definitely the source of it. My mind was racing, overwhelmed by the sheer hopelessness of this situation. I had not yet gotten fully used to fighting underwater, and my gear was nowhere near ready to take on something this large. Forget that, even in terms of movement I was hopelessly outmatched. A single stroke of its limbs propelled the creature a distance many times my size. If it decided to lunge at me, I had nothing. Suspended in this horrifying moment, my torment evolved. The spikes on the creature's back suddenly began to glow, dimly at first, but then more intensely, alighting rhythmically on and off, on and off, a pulsating bright light piercing through the murky coastal sea. This was not simply bioluminescence. Every pulse was accompanied with a deep, rumbling sound, and every time the spikes pulsed, the current in the water intensified tenfold. The creature was charging up electricity. 
It was faster, larger, and more used to this environment than me. And now it was readying an elemental attack. I was done for. Or so I thought. Once the beast was only a few meters away from where I hovered, still frozen in fear, it slowed down and eventually came to a halt. For a brief moment, neither of us moved as its pulsing spikes continued their performance. Then, a second sound joined the cacophony. A low, guttural rumbling like that of a large crocodilian. This time, it came from the creature's mouth. In that moment, I finally realized what was happening. The pulses, the slow approach, and now the growling. This was a threat display, a final warning for me to immediately leave this monster's territory. With terror pounding in my chest, I slowly began backing away, paddling my legs so that I could swim backwards without turning my back to the creature. It, in return, recoiled its head slightly and lowered its rumbling voice. I continued to retreat until eventually I saw the now distant shadow of the creature turn away and swim back into the abyssal murk. From then on, I began swimming like I had never before. Without as much as taking a breath, I arrived back in Moga village, shaking, soaked in sweat, about ready to collapse. As I sat down to recover from my tremor, I recounted my experience to the chief and the other villagers, and, much to my anger, none of them were particularly surprised. This was, without a doubt, what they had not wanted to talk about. The chief then explained that this creature was called Lagayacris, and that they believe that its rummaging around the coast and waters causes earthquakes whenever it rams its body into something. When I inquired as to why they would keep this from me, he sheepishly justified it by saying that it had already taken so much time and arguing to get the guild to send a single hunter to help them. They simply didn't want to run the risk of scaring me off. I suppose they hoped I would get attached to the village over time before they could reveal the existence of this creature to me, at which point I would be too invested to simply quit. Well, joke's on them. I was already too invested. While this Lagayacris was certainly a much bigger problem than what I could handle at this moment, I felt oddly compelled to push myself. All my life, I had been nothing but a failure. Dead weight that brought down anyone and everyone around me. I never quite got over the feeling that every breath I took was some sort of mistake, my existence itself a burden to anyone unfortunate enough to witness it. So, here, now, I felt like I had to try. I had to help save Moga. And maybe, myself. The preparations needed towards taking down that Lagayacris were much more intense than I would have expected. I obviously had to train and hone my craft, as well as procure stronger materials and ores for the smithy to craft me gear worthy of such a hunt. To that end, I traveled far and wide to hunt various monsters and grow as a hunter. I bested wraths, I conquered a Baryoth, I even captured a Nargakuga at night. I also focused on learning my way around fighting underwater by volunteering for hunts involving underwater creatures such as the Gobul. But I wasn't the only factor in this. The villagers were hard at work fortifying the village as well as preparing the island for the battle to come. Aisha requested information on the Lagayacris from the guild, and sure enough, a compiled report arrived in our village just two days later. Classified as a Leviathan, the rare Lagayacris is highly aggressive and territorial. The structures on its back are called shell shockers, and they indeed charge up thunder element to be discharged in large waves that electrify anything in its range. They do have a weakness, however. They can only be used underwater, as air isn't conductive enough to allow the charge to spread. So, if we can lure it out of the water, 
we remove its most dangerous weapon and cripple its effectiveness significantly. After some digging, there was one detail in the guild's report that provided a possible way to make that happen. Lagiacris rarely venture onto land, but there is one thing that they cannot do underwater. Clean their teeth. Lagia teeth do not regrow and must be maintained through hygiene, which is only possible by letting birds pick off the gunk and leftovers from the teeth and gums. To do this, the Lagiacris will come on land and lay with their mouth open for long periods of time, attracting various species of birds to the buffet. A classic symbiosis, and the perfect time to strike. Once the plan had been established, everyone got to work. The fishermen and women began churning out chum rapidly, mixing it with stringy meat and tree sap to make it as sticky as possible. The idea was that this concoction would be dumped near the Lagiacris' territory over a period of time. The fish smell would attract the leviathan and cause it to eat the mushy fish treat. After enough time, the sticky mixture is bound to clog up and coat the creature's teeth, who will then recognize this as a problem and emerge from the water to request a cleanup. This would be heralded by most birds on the island flocking to one spot on the beach, and that would be my signal to spring into action. While this was going on, my training continued and even produced some unexpected results. On one of my travels, I encountered a curious creature called a Shakalaka. This one, who insisted his name was Chacha, would not stop babbling about a golden mask it was searching for. We just about managed to come to an agreement that if I helped him look for the mask, he would lend me his Shakalaka strength for the upcoming fight. The Shakalaka are a mysterious tribe whose masks and ceremonial dances are known to bestow great power onto their allies. It would not hurt to have this little fellow on my side. I believe we agreed on a partnership, but it was a little hard to tell considering Chacha would not stop insulting me in every other breath. But nonetheless, he followed me in my quests and was a stalwart companion from that day onwards. As the preparations were going on, I began noticing an odd pattern regarding the village chief. By day, he was an active fellow, joyfully giving advice to the adults and telling tall tales to the children. But at night, he mostly sat at the furthest docks, solemnly looking out towards the sea, looking for… something. Asking the others revealed that this behavior had only started since the Lagiacris had been spotted. So. One night, I sat down beside him and simply asked him why he did it. A deep sigh and a pull of his pipe later, he revealed his truth to me. The chief had, long ago, been a hunter himself, and quite a famous one. Upon hearing his old name, my memory stirred to my days in training, hearing tales of a seafaring warrior who never faltered. I wondered out loud how someone so famous would find himself here of all places. He laughed and explained further. He was the descendant of an ancient tribe, one that once lived in the many ruins that litter Moga Island and the seas below. After he retired, he used his funds from his hunting days to build a small village here to honor his ancestors. Gradually, more descendants of the old folk found their way here, and before long, Moga Village was born. At that moment, it became clear to me why the guild had been convinced to even send a single hunter into this place, following an absurd report of monster-made earthquakes. It was out of respect for this man. The honor and respect the chief had embodied in his career had eventually paved the path for my journey here, and for my growth. In fact, it was likely that many of the quests I was able to go on from here were only approved as a favor to this man. I was overcome with a deep emotion. All my life, I had felt like I stood alone. 
now I realized that my journey, my growth, had taken place on a road built by those around me, those that cared. I asked the final question, one whose answer I already suspected. Why did you retire? In Guild Record, he simply stops appearing, presumably just riding off into the sunset as a legend. The Chief's account of it ended in tragedy, however. His undefeated hunting party was annihilated by a white Lagayacris, with him being the only survivor. The emergence of another Lagayacris was thus painful for him, a reminder of the misery his career and his friends met at their end. And now, the baton fell to me. He had lived, he had hunted, and his life was now his to reminisce and regret. I, however, stood at the precipice, to either fulfill the unspoken wish of revenge for this man, or fail, again. Fail as I have always failed. But somehow, this time, my heart was not overcome by self-pity. I looked into the chief's eyes and saw true friendship and trust in them. He believed in me. And I would do my best to live up to that. Crouching in a bush, I saw it. The plan had worked exactly as expected. Its teeth oily and dirty, the Lagayacris had come on land, and the birds had indeed flocked to it. The village had barricaded itself upon seeing the signal, and I, accompanied by Chacha, had snuck up on the beast, ready to strike. My dual blades were well sharpened and ready. By moving through the bushes, we had gotten shockingly close to the Leviathan, as the Lagayacris has no electrical sensory abilities on land as it does in water. A step closer, two steps closer, I readied my weapon. Chacha held his breath. I waited for the creature to close its eyes, as it often does when lying prone. Not yet. Not yet. The eye shut, and strike! The creature recoiled as I jumped out from the bushes and slashed at its face, leaving a deep gash across it. Unfortunately, my blade had been deflected by its horns, so the hit was nowhere near as decisive as I would have preferred. Regaining my stance, with Chacha at my side performing one of his mysterious dances, we faced the Lagayacris as it reared up and roared in anger. On land, it was much less mobile than in water, its long body moving around awkwardly and without the grace of our last encounter. I, on the other hand, was a flurry of blades, my preparations blossoming into a full state of flow in which my swords danced in complete freedom. For every step the beast took, I took two. Within minutes, the Lagayacris was covered in cuts and lacerations, and the battle was decidedly going our way. Its shell shocker sat there, impotent when exposed to air, while the Leviathan flailed around helplessly. At one point, it reared back and charged at me at full speed. I dodged easily and turned around to anticipate the next attack and... It was gone. To my horror, there was nothing behind me but the beach and the sea. In my flow state, I hadn't noticed that my back was turned to the water and, seeing an opportunity, the Lagayacris had charged not at me, but into the safety of its home turf. For a moment, I threatened to despair. All that effort. But within seconds, my resolve solidified. There would be no other chance. This was it. And if that meant fighting the Lord of the Sea in his own kingdom, so be it. And so, me and Chacha descended into the murky depths once again, and before long, we found our target. The Lagayacris stood still for a moment, almost as if an acknowledgement of either my bravery or my misfortune. And then, in one fell swoop, it activated all of its shell shockers at once, sending out a current of static that would have likely knocked me out a few months ago. But not today. 
fighting the Legiacris underwater was an entirely different story. Through using my blades as paddles, as well as with help from Chacha, I could gather just enough speed to dodge the ferocious onslaught the beast unleashed on us. Its movements were fast and graceful, a torrent of teeth and claws that barreled at me relentlessly. But the biggest danger came from the shockers. They were unable to release thunder continuously, but when they were fully charged, they could turn a wide radius around the Legiacris into a deadly sphere of crackling electricity. It took everything I had to get out of these thunder charges in time. At one point, I was but a moment too slow and my foot got caught in the outer perimeter of this charge. The potency of the attack diminishes with distance, but even being grazed by it entirely paralyzed my foot for the time being, slowing me down considerably. That was when I decided that I had to end this fight quickly. By the time the beast's shockers would be recharged, I would lose this fight and my life. So I had to finish this before the shockers were ready, or at the very least incapacitate the thunder attack itself. As I circled the beast, I positioned myself between the Lagiacris and one of the underwater rock walls of the reef. Sure enough, the Leviathan turned to its side and tried to slam into me with its hip, a move I had noticed it do whenever its shockers were truly empty. This time, I dodged, with Cha-Cha carrying me forward to compensate for my paralyzed foot. Before I even turned around, I found that my gamble had paid off. The Lagiacris had crashed directly into the rock wall, and as it reeled from the pain, I saw my opportunity. The collision had cracked one of its shockers. A Lagiacris needs all of them intact for its thunder organ to function. My time had come. I propped my functioning foot up against the wall and propelled myself forwards, the force boosted by the dance Chacha had been saving for this moment. As I jetted towards the Lagiacris, I spun my body around, corkscrewing towards the beast that had still not fully recovered. Empowered by my speed and rotation, I hit the crack in the shocker with both of my blades at once, at full force, and successfully broke it off. A scream of pain echoed through the underwater valley. The Lagiacris was flailing in agony, roaring and shrieking as its most prized weapon had been destroyed. It was very clearly in immense pain. Its guard was down, its vulnerable chest that it had kept protected so far was now wide open and exposed. All that was left was to put the animal out of its misery. I mustered the last of my strength and plunged both of my blades deep into the Lagiacris heart. A cloud of wispy blood mixed with the water and enveloped the two of us, and once it subsided, the Lagiacris simply hung suspended in the water, motionless, lifeless. As I looked upon the dead leviathan, I did not feel the ecstatic pride of accomplishment I was expecting. While I was happy to be victorious, something was off. Something didn't feel right. Even after I had carved a few choice materials off the corpse and had resurfaced on land, the victory still had this sour note to it, as if I had missed something. I felt frustrated that I couldn't even enjoy this moment. I had beaten the Lagiacris. Not just that, I had outsmarted it with a move that surprised even me in hindsight. Using a wall like that was... Wait. I shuddered as I realized what had been bugging me. The collision with the wall was enough to severely injure the Lagiacris, but our hypothesis had so far been that it was causing the earthquakes by thrashing around underwater and smashing into the island base. How could these two things be true at once? In short, they could not. Before I could even conclude this thought, as if to mock me, an earthquake silently shook the island, confirming my fear. We had targeted the wrong monster. I raced back to the village, where everyone was already gathered in a nervous crowd. Upon arrival, they all held me close. They had been worried that I had lost and that the tremor was the beast's celebration. I showed them the materials I had carved to assure them of my victory, but immediately shot down their elation as I told them that the earthquake had occurred after the beast had died. Confusion took hold of Moga. 
No one could really explain how this would be possible. The Lagayacris was the largest and toughest monster known to inhabit this island, so who or what else could be causing these tremors? After some short and heated discussion, our answer walked into town, soaked and horrified. The chief's son. Upon feeling the earthquake, he had descended down into the waters below Moga to see if I needed help. While doing so, he had witnessed the cause of the tremors firsthand. In a tunnel of ancient ruins that run beneath the village, he spotted a creature scraping its head across the rocks, shaking the ground in the process. This sea serpent, as he describes it, was, in his words, large enough to swallow a Lagayacris whole. We just sat there for a while, in silent, all-consuming horror. A few days later, the letter from the guild arrived. After the chief's son had described the monster he had seen in the underwater ruins, Aisha had had the wherewithal to write down his account and immediately send it to the guild headquarters with a request for further instructions and help. And that communication had finally been answered. According to the guild records, the monster that most closely matched the given description was the Sedeus, an elder dragon characterized by a long beard, massive horns, and an entirely aquatic life. This, by itself, was terrible news. Elder dragons are living, breathing forces of nature, nearly unstoppable without large-scale intervention. Luckily, the guild was one of the few organizations in the world that had the means of repelling an elder dragon, so surely, we thought, this matter could be settled swiftly and painlessly with their help. As for the letter responding to a request for help, Aisha didn't show it at first looking upon it with an indecipherable expression. Anxiously, but gently, I took the paper from her hands and, expecting good news, read the message out loud. The guild hereby decrees that all present guild staff, hunters, scriveners, smiths, immediately begin evacuating the village of the name Moga. All residents are to be convinced to abandon their homes and board the first ship away from the island. They will be taken in as refugees in Tanzia and Loklak and redistributed accordingly. The island and the hunting ground, known as the Deserted Island, are hereby declared no man's land, and travel to, across, or near these locations will henceforth be prohibited by guild authority. We understand that the loss of the village will be painful, but after careful consideration, the guild has deemed the location to not be valuable enough to justify the sacrifice, manpower, and resources it would take to repel and or slay the Elder Dragon. Disobedience with this decree will be considered a crime. The message would have gone on, but I simply stopped reading. I slowly lowered the paper. I barely noticed it slip out of my hands. I looked around to see numerous averted gazes. My ears were drowning in silence, interrupted only by the occasional quiet sobs. I didn't know what to say. Before I could change that, the villagers came up to me and one by one patted me on the shoulder to offer words of consolation. You did your best. We appreciate all your effort. Chin up. Even the chief, his jolly smile faded, put his fist against my chest, and murmured something about having had a good run. At that moment, I should have felt sadness. And yet my chest was engulfed in frustrated rage. These people had just lost their home, their everything. And yet here I was, being comforted by them. No, I thought. No, I said out loud. All the heads in the village turned to me, and just as my body had moved on its own while facing the Lagayacris, my words spilled forth almost automatically. This is your home. You live here. Your parents lived here. And your children deserve to live here. So what if there's an elder dragon? So what if the guild thinks it's not worth it? 
To them, this might just be a distant island in the ocean, but for you, for me, Moga is everything. It's not worthless. It's our home. So, I will stay. I won't force anyone to disobey the guild alongside me. But I also will not leave. We already bested the Lagiacris. What's one more giant sea serpent? Before I had even finished speaking, embarrassment washed over me. I was a newcomer, an outsider, and now I dared to grandstand about the need to protect this village? What's worse, I had expressed an intention of disobedience and tried to imply that they should follow my lead. I averted my eyes, sure that they would otherwise only be met with disappointment and scorn, as always. But then, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Then two. Then a third on my other shoulder. By the time I looked up again, the villagers had surrounded me, holding on to me and each other, looking at me with wet eyes, gleaming with pride and love. Wordlessly, with wide smiles, they all nodded ever so slightly. We would slay the Sidious. Together. The work began swiftly. The earthquakes had been getting more frequent while we had waited for the guild to respond, and so it was assumed that the dragon was nearing the village from below. The chief's son gathered the men and began hauling various artillery and harpooning equipment down to the shore. They would drop it into the underwater ruins for me to find and pick up and use during my battle if I was lucky. Chacha was eagerly discussing something with the head farmer. Apparently there was an old masked monument near the village farm. The women, meanwhile, concocted various potions and elixirs, demon drugs and armor skins that would empower me in this battle. As I was gathering my things, Aisha walked up to me and held me close. We exchanged no words, but I understood what she meant. She was going to deceive the guild by sending in a delay report, buying us enough time to beat the Sedeus and hopefully earn our place in the guild back through that feat. After all, the repelling of an elder dragon is too big of an achievement to overlook. Probably because it is an almost impossible task. The deep waters were quiet. Pushing further and further into the depths, I found myself swallowed by a deep nothingness. No light, no life, no anything. All I had was myself and Chacha, who wore his new mask proudly. Together with the villagers, he had discovered that the mask statue at the farm was actually a sort of relic from the old Moga civilization. The mask could store and share oxygen during underwater exploration, and as it so happened, it fit Chacha like a glove. The tiny shakalaka swam next to me enthusiastically, occasionally tugging at my leg to ask if I needed any oxygen from his cool new mask. Nearing the entrance of the underwater ruins, where the Sedeus was distantly spotted by the chief's son, I noticed a dim light emanating from them. The walls and arches of structures long gone were partially covered by colonies of bioluminescent critters. Algae? Or perhaps plankton? Either way, they provided some much-needed visibility, as I now had to navigate these underwater tunnels to find the Elder Dragon. Swimming through the remnants of Old Moga, I tried my hardest to keep my thoughts focused on the task. Here, in a pit of the past, where what was rests in perpetuity, I was to slay an ancient serpent. That's all there is to it, I thought. And yet, passing through this valley of the gone and forgotten, I couldn't help but see myself reflected in this place. I had been a failure. My past had marked me as such. And now, here, in this temple of the withered old, I was to ensure the future of those who had accepted me Nonetheless, my thoughts were interrupted, as the moment finally came. The corridor I had been swimming through opened up into a large coliseum, 
a wide circle of windowed walls, platforms, and pillars. It reached so far up that the upper layer of the arena was bathed in sunlight penetrating through the surface. The bottom of this room, meanwhile, was a murky blackness, an unsure abyss I was to keep away from. And in the center of it all, curled up, hovered the Sedeus. It was an enormous mass of millennial growth and ancient beauty. An incomprehensibly long, whale-like body that ended in a small head, crowned by two gargantuan horns. Its underside was covered in long, shaggy fur, and its tail was covered in scales that, even at a distance, looked almost impenetrable. It struck me that I might be the first person to ever clearly look upon this creature in its entire life. Elder dragons can live up to a thousand years, and in all that time, the Sedeus lay waiting for the one who'd witness it, the one who'd slay it. Me. My thoughts were pulled towards an old rhyme I heard during my training days, from a Vivarian who loved to tell old legends after a pint. His face escaped me, but his words rang clearly through my mind. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far beneath the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep forms a silent plea. There hath he lain for ages, and will lie, battening upon huge sea worms in his sleep until the dragon fire heats the deep. Then once by man to be seen, in roaring he shall rise, and on the surface die. I don't remember what the old Vivarian said about the poem's context, but in my heart, I knew that no words could have described this creature any better. I nodded to Chacha and we began approaching the beast. It seemingly hadn't taken notice of us yet, or at least didn't consider us a threat. As we moved closer, I saw a weighted bag sitting on one of the stone platforms. The artillery ammo the villagers had dropped into the sea. Some of it had luckily managed to find its way here. Carefully, I pocketed some of the ammunition and made my way around the dragon. Sure enough, this must have been some kind of battleground. There were two ballastae standing in two of the stone pillars around the area, and in between them, an aged but otherwise functional looking Dragonator was visible. I took one last moment to compose myself, loaded the ammunition into the ballista, and fired into the Cedius' flesh. The harpoon hit it in the fin, and the dragon uncoiled, roaring in pain and anger, finally recognizing me for the challenger I had made myself into. I darted away from the ballista, anticipating a counterattack, and just in time. Not one moment later, the Sedeos crashed into the pillar I had just been on, pulverizing one of the ballista immediately. I spun around, ready to defend myself, but to my surprise, the Sedeos was sheepishly looking around, as if to recover from the charge. Then I realized that it was looking for me. As it turned towards me, it spotted me, and I spotted the cause of all our troubles. One of the Sedeus's horns had grown larger and thicker than the other, and in the process grew over one of the dragon's eyes. It was likely in immense pain, as well as half-blind. I had to ignore my sense of empathy and pity. If I didn't stop this creature, Moga would likely be destroyed by one of its tremors soon. And at this point, Putting the dragon out of its misery might be the kindest thing I could do. I launched myself towards it and began slashing at the Sedeos relentlessly. It thrashed around, and a few times it almost got me, but without fail, I was able to weave through its attacks while staying on the offensive. Before long, my actual plan was ready. As the creature moved and thrashed, it had continuously made its way towards the weaponry wall of the arena. I gave Chacha the signal, and with a gurgling scream, the Shakalaka sank its weapon into the Sedeos' hide, latching on tight. As the Elder Dragon coiled and roared, trying to shake off its small assailant, I swam and swam and swam until I reached it. 
the lever for the Dragonator. A Dragonator is a ghoulishly effective weapon. A giant drill spear propelled by a controlled explosive. I pulled the lever with a scream, and to my joy heard the mechanism churn. With a bellowing roar, the Dragonator sprang forth, its serrated spear tip plunging deep into the Cedius, which roared in return. A cloud of blood engulfed the dragon, but way sooner than I was hoping, its giant tail swung through the red mist and swiped both me and Chacha out of range. As I recovered from the hit, I looked upon the Sedeus and felt it. The true primal terror that only an elder dragon can inspire. The Dragonator had mutilated its beard-like mane. Underneath that mane, multiple glowing spots were now visible. But what truly shook me was what had happened to the arena. The dark abyss at the bottom of the pit had now alighted with millions of bioluminescent organisms, the same ones that had littered the caves. In fact, it seemed as if all of those colonies were glowing in unison, answering a sort of call from the Sedeus. The beast itself was glowing the same shade of pale green, as if it was uniting the power these organisms were granting it. Before I could even begin to hypothesize, the dragon opened its maw and, with an awful shriek, spewed a beam of luminescent pressurized water at us. I instinctively tried to block it, but dual blades are not meant to be defensive weapons. I was hit head on and my vision faded. I was out for maybe just a few seconds, but I awoke to a world of pain. My entire body was sore, and while I was miraculously not bleeding, the smithy's work had paid off, I was certain that at least a few of my ribs were broken. My ears were ringing and my mouth was filled with a metallic taste. Dazed, I looked up and saw Chacha floating in the water, unconscious and badly hurt. I tried to get my bearings and saw before me an inferno. The glow of the organisms had changed in color, now a deep red, reflected in the glowing spots of the Sedeus' body. It howled in anger, now fully charged and ready to kill me. This was now a true elder dragon, not a passive beast, but a natural disaster looking upon its poor victim. But I also noticed that its movements were labored. The Dragonator had really damaged it, and using this much energy was likely sapping its strength. I gripped my two swords, battered and chipped, and for some reason, I felt peace. Not the kind in which you accept death, I was determined to win. No, it felt more as if this was where I was always meant to be. All my struggles, my worries, my self-doubts, they had led me here. Here, where I stood before an abyssal king, backed against a wall, ready to annihilate myself to save the lives of those who had shown me kindness. It didn't feel tragic. Helping others is like breathing, the most natural thing in the world and I had the privilege of helping all of those who had accepted me at once. Ignoring the pain, I propelled myself forwards. The Sedeus, now shaking with exhaustion, but red with rage, coiled itself, ready to charge at me at full speed. We both understood that the next hit would be the decisive one. And so, as I barreled towards victory or death, my heart was filled with the faces of Moga. In that moment, suspended in a dark abyss, dancing with the god of the deep, I truly felt purposeful, like I had finally found my spot in the fabric of nature. I had become one with life.
Thank you everyone for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. A very special thank you to all of our patrons. Quick reminder, if you sign up for the patron, you get to watch videos a few days earlier, so consider that if this is something you're interested in. A very, very special thank you to Fiction Ape, Anthony the Hedgehog, Arcturian711, Big Pidge, Claire Miboon, Danilo Villavicencio, Dicey, Gio, Habomir123, Hashi, Jameson Tate, Magenta Magenta, Makot O2, Mench, Mr. Pyramid, Mr. Meander, Pere Fuego, Peroscoco, Person 212, Project Iceman, Sir Newt Newt, Oakwood Tree, Iron Camel, and Courage. Take care everyone, and I'll see you around next time. Bye bye.